Morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome. Lovely to see you. Um, welcome to our anniversary service. So celebrating the anniversary of Hill Lane as a chapel. Um, very pleased to welcome Chris Spracklin, who's come all the way from Martock this morning. Lovely drive, though, today. Lovely weather out there. Um, hopefully you avoided the potholes once you got off the main road. Yeah, we thought we had potholes in Martock. Yeah, you haven't experienced yeah. ours. <laughs> They're pretty bad. Um, so uh, I'll be leading the first half of the service and then uh, handing over to Chris, who will take us um, through, I think, some worship and some um, talk. We're switching between technologies this morning as well, so bear with us if it doesn't work. We've practiced it and it all seems to be working, but there's a lot of pressure on Rue's shoulders this morning. So um, if there are any glitches, just bear with us. Uh, as it's an anniversary service, I've built in a little bit of a longer time of worship as well. So it might go on a little bit longer than the normal finish time. Hopefully that's okay. If you do have to rush, uh, totally understand. There will be tea, coffee and cake afterwards as an incentive to stay. So there you go. Right, let's uh, open in prayer. Lord, thank you. Um, we can see signs of spring all around us, a reminder of your wondrous creation, Lord. Particularly blessed to live in an area like this where we can just um, see it all around us and many of the farmers who are here are working directly with it every day, Lord. Um, I just thank you that uh, it's a sign of your renewal and that you're here again as we come again up towards the Easter period, Lord. I pray that you'll just um, really speak through everything that happens this morning um, as we celebrate the, the founding of this chapel um, and also the message um, that you've laid on Chris's heart to give to us today. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Uh, Craig is hopefully going to help lead worship this morning, so um, he's going to be singing. Craig's voice has been a little bit ropey, so uh, we'll see if it lasts. Pray for Craig. But um, we're going to open first by singing uh, 10,000 Reasons. Thank you. You like the sound?
Please be seated. Uh, okay, notices. Um, mostly on the notice sheet that you've hopefully had by email, um, two things to highlight. One, uh, Wednesday House Group will be at Roger and Julia's. Uh, so those of you go to Lynn's House Group at Roger and Julia's this week. Normal time, Linda? Normal time, fab. Um, other thing to highlight is there will be an evening service today because it's the church anniversary celebration. So Chris is here both for the morning and the evening. Um, the evening will be a little bit different. Um, so I'll be leading the first half. Apologies, you've got me again. Uh, but only for like 10, 15 minutes. And I'll be handing over to Chris. And Chris will be doing a lot more um, leading of worship and interspersing that with um, bits and pieces, I guess, Chris. So um, it's going to be interesting. Another, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to come on to next is Chris's theme for the whole of today is heaven. So for those of you here last week, we had hell. Today we've got the opposite, which is heaven, um, which fits in really nice to a celebration service. Um, so yeah, come along this evening, 6.30, uh, to hear more about what Chris will start speaking about this morning. Uh, and I, th I think that's it, unless anyone's going to shout. No? Fantastic. Okay, um, we're going to have a bit of a time of worship now then. Um, so I've got three songs. Uh, feel free to stand or sit uh, as you're able. Um, Craig's going to lead us again. Uh, build your kingdom here. Come on and celebrate and let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Just uh, that theme of celebration for the, the anniversary service today. So thank you, Craig.
Thank you, Music Group. Thank you, Craig. Uh, okay, so, Rue, can I have my PowerPoint up? Um, I was thinking about what to say before the young people went out, and I thought, uh, Chris is speaking on Heaven Later. We had Hell last week. It's an anniversary celebration today. So I thought I would do a little bit on uh, sort of the history of the church, this church, uh, and when it was founded and all that kind of stuff, because some of us probably know it and some of us probably don't have a clue um, of the background. Uh, so I've got my little timeline up here that shall come in order in a minute. But first of all, I thought I'd ask, young people, what do you consider is old? And parents are fair game, unless you're my child, in which case you're not. Okay. Grandparents, even more fair game. But what, what do you consider is old? 47. 47, thank you. <laughs> that would be my age as of last week. Go on, what's old? 53 years old. Okay. Are we going any older or younger than 53? <laughs> was that you were going to say 46 as well? So that's Rachel's age. What's Jess? Jess, go on. What were you thinking? 18 is old. Yeah. 18 is getting quite old. Sophie will be 18 in a week or so's time. 17. Sorry, 17. <laughs> Awkward dad moment. <laughs> Moving on. For those of you who drive around here, she'll be learning to drive as well, so it could be even more worrying. Watch out for the potholes. Right, so anyway, let's go through. So how, okay, so how old do you think this church is then? Not this building, but the actual congregation. Uh, when was it founded? Let's go with that as an easier question. Go on, what do you reckon? 40 years old. Nope. Loads more than that. Hmm? No, no. The fellowship. Not not the building. Go on. Hundred or so years. That's a pretty good guess, actually. I thought I'd put that in context as well as other things so you can see what was around and what wasn't around when the church was started. Okay, so Rue, click through. So first one, thought I'd start at the beginning, Jesus. It's children's talk, it's got to have Jesus in there. First Easter, around probably 33 AD. Then a big jump to, next one, Rue, uh, 1815. So that was the Bible Christian movement of which this fellowship was originally a part and all of the other fellowships within Rings Ash. So that started in 1815 in North Devon and then moved around this area. Um, Keep going, Rue. 1849, first telegraph line. So that was when telephones started. So when the Bible Christians first started, that was all word of mouth, traveling on foot, horse and cart. They couldn't pick up a phone or talk to anyone. Keep going, Rue. 1858, Heal Lane was founded, called Providence Chapel. So who said it was further down the lane originally? So if you go to the graveyard down Hill Lane, so go to the crossroads there, turn right, the graveyard down the bottom, that's where the original chapel was, Cobb Building. So we bought that, apparently, hang on, let me get me facts. Roger Thorne did a great thing on this. If you go onto the, the Rings Ash website, you can find all, all about this. We bought a privately owned chapel, schoolroom, cottage, and burial ground down at Hill Lane for the princely sum of two pounds. Now... 1858, that was probably an awful lot of money, actually. I don't know what that's worth. Probably a lot today. Um, it says, although cheap, this building caused expense later when one of the walls collapsed and had to be rebuilt in the 1920s. <laughs> buy cheap, buy twice, isn't it? Anyway, moving on, next. So, motor car, 1886. First motor car. Most people wouldn't have had one then, though. It had only been the really rich people. So, still horse and travel. Most of these lanes around here probably existed, but they would have been stone or mud yeah they might have been better <laughs> in terms of traveling along keep going Rue. uh 1925 first television broadcast so before then the only thing you had was a telephone if you were lucky uh when heel lane was founded no electricity either at that point it would have come along later so it would have all been candles um keep going Rue. 1956 we moved to this building so apparently, as you know, this used to be a school. Some of the congregation used to go here. I don't think any of them are here today. There aren't many of them left who used to go to here as a child. But um, 
This was a school originally. So uh, it was offered for sale in 1955 when it closed. Yeah, Auntie Phyllis was around, yeah. And Eric and Dennis used to go here, didn't they, as, as children when they were alive? Uh, apparently, the congregation agonized about buying it because by that point, the Cobb building down at Hill Lane was falling into disrepair, um, but decided against it. It was sold, but then it came back on the market very quickly, um, and the congregation decided this was a prophetic sign, and uh, so bought the building. Um, so moved in here and opened in 1956. Uh, so keep going, Rue. 1980s, internet was invented. So when most of us were children, uh, no internet. Keep going. 1990s, mobile phones. So again, when most of us were children, no mobile phones. Uh, smartphones didn't come along until uh, later than that. The original 1980s ones were enormous. It was so, well, the very early ones were so big you can only have them in a car. Then they got to be the size of a brick, didn't they, which you could carry around and the battery didn't last very long. Um, and then gradually they've got smaller and smaller. Keep going, Rue. Uh, present day. So if I've got my maths right, that means we're 166 years old as a congregation uh, this year. I don't know the exact day when it was founded in uh, 1858. So all I can say is this year at some point. And then uh, moving on, the future, hopefully at some point, Jesus returns, linking into the discussion about, about heaven later. Uh, I would like to think as a congregation, hopefully we'll still be around then. But of course, we don't know when that will be some point in the future. Uh, so there you go. So old, 166, does that count as old? There's no one in this congregation alive still who was here when it was originally founded. Uh, Auntie Phyllis, probably one of the few that would have been here when it moved from the old site down at the graveyard to the new site here. Uh, but most of us have been coming here since, haven't we? Um, and who knows, you guys are the future, aren't you? You'll be, uh, if you stay around in this area, you'll be helping hopefully keep this congregation going and worshipping God. Um, if you're interested, the other chapels in the circuit, um, so Mortcher Bishop, which is Emmanuel Chapel, that uh, was founded in 1846. Bible Christians originally came to Mortchard in 1819. Um, 1846, and then they built the Sunday school bit on the side in 1928. Uh, Copleston's quite interesting. So Copleston as a parish didn't exist until 1992, apparently. So the original building, uh, sorry, the current built church in Copleston was in Down St. Mary Parish. The cemetery was in Colebrook Parish. And the... It used to be across the road, and the across the road was in Crediton. So it's a bit like no man's land is at the moment. You had three parishes joining, but then in 1992, they made it into one. Uh, so the original Copleston Chapel was built across the road from where it is now in 1831. And then uh, it moved when they needed more room. And in 1888, they moved across the road to its present site. I'm guessing the old site is probably where Central is or something like that, for those of you who know Copleston. Um, and then they built the community room behind that building in 1981. That's when they sold the old um, chapel building. And then Witheridge. Uh, Witheridge, Bible Christian Services again, 1819. Uh, the first chapel they had was an old Cobb and, Thatch, Cobb and Thatch barn, so built in 1855, which is on the site of the present school rooms, for those of you who know Witheridge. Uh, then they started a Sunday school. They needed more rooms, a common theme here. So two cottages beside the chapel were bought and the present chapel was built on that site. That opened in 1859. And then in 1903, they extended that and built the, um, the current sort of Sunday school rooms that are behind the main chapel building. Uh, and of course, we converted, well, renovated this back in, what, early 2000s? Something like that? So that's when all the pews got taken out. Uh, the original school door moved from over there to the new extension here with the kitchen put on the side and stuff like that. So the buildings are continuing to evolve to serve the needs of the congregations, which is the right thing, I think. So there you go. Hopefully that was um, a little bit interesting. Uh, I'm just going to pray for the young people and the leaders before they go out, um, and then we'll sing again. Lord, thank you that um, you've had uh, 
a presence in, and a circuit here for uh, a long time, Lord, of um, dedicated followers of you who are preaching your word in this area, Lord, and, and seeking to build your kingdom in this local community. Lord, I pray that will continue. Um, and I particularly pray as uh, young people go out for their morning classes, Lord, that you'll just um, be with them, be with the teachers uh, and just help uh, to build and strengthen those relationships that they already have with you, Lord, so that they can be um, future leaders uh, and preachers and spread your word um, wherever they end up in their lives, Lord. And that, um, the work that you've started here in this local area can then spread and grow uh, maybe around the country, maybe around the world, Lord. We just ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to um, sing again now. Uh, what a beautiful name.
and just pray for Chris before he comes up to uh, lead the rest of the service. Uh, Lord, thank you for Chris. Thank you for uh, the ministry that he's carried out um, for a long time now, Lord. And thank you that he's come here today to um, talk to us about what you've laid on his heart and, um, and share things with us, Lord. I just pray that you really speak clearly through him now uh, in your voice um, and that each one of us all uh, take uh, whatever it is that you want to lay on our hearts away from today's uh, service and talk, Lord. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you very much, Andy. Good morning, everybody. So lovely to be to be here again and on this special day, your anniversary. You're quite a bit older than our church. I think we were established by 1893, so maybe there's even someone here that old this morning. You remember that? Probably not. Um, my dear old mum's 90, um, and uh, that's pretty old, but uh, yeah, we're all getting older by the day, and we all get old eventually if we live long enough don't we so <laughs> that's it uh, i was with uh, a young man called paul sheriff uh, on friday evening most of you won't know that name but you probably know the name terry not and paul sheriff is terry's son-in-law and he's part of our congregation one of our leaders actually with his wife near me and uh, i told him i was coming down here and he said oh he was at mortchard preaching last sunday and he said you want to mine the potholes he said <laughs> So that really spooked my wife because um, she decided not to come because she had a really, really busy week and just needed the day to sort of recover. But she does most of the driving because once I get in the car, I've been in there five minutes, I usually fall asleep. So she was really panicking that I was coming down here and having to go through all these potholes. So I did ring her as soon as I got here and said, we're okay. I only went through one pothole and that was one I couldn't actually miss because it covered practically the whole road. So I said I went very gently. So that was fine. Anyway, it's lovely to be here. And, oh! Lovely to stop my guitar on the floor. Something's falling out inside. Okay, that's interesting. The battery's falling out. Happily, it will play without the battery, so we'll fix that this afternoon. It's nearly happened last Sunday in Lyme Regis, and I caught it. Put it back, put the strap on again. Wasn't expecting it to fall off that quickly. <sighs> Went to the doctors this week, and my blood pressure was up. I'd been retired six weeks. Lost all my stress, and my blood pressure goes up. I think it's just gone up again. Guitars don't like falling on the floor, they go out of tune. There was a concert the other night. Glenn Campbell's daughter was singing, and the guy was tuning his, every song they tune their guitar, so you're getting off lightly. <laughs> so I'm going to sing you a song about heaven song I wrote a long time ago. I just started singing some of my old songs again because that generation that I sang them to is a lot older and some of them are gone. So I just started singing some of them again. This seemed appropriate this morning as this is what I want to talk to you about. We better take a glass of water first. Ah. Don't know if you believe in a place where the gates are pearls, the streets are gold, a land that's full of every tribe and race where there's no more rain and no more cold, where angels live with humans singing the same song, and where everyone is happy, and sad things don't belong. If you did, would you call it heaven? If you did, would you call it home? If you did, would you call it heaven? If you did, would you call it home? Ah, 
I don't know if you believe in a place where there's no more pain and no more tears A land that's lit by the light of a face where there's no more night and no more years Where the days are never ending cause the sun shines on and on And where death no longer figures and where every fear is gone If you did, would you call it heaven? If you did, would you call it home? If you did, would you call it heaven? If you did, would you call it home? I don't know if you believe in a place where we can live When this life's through A land that's opened by God's grace to the likes of me The likes of you where God is king forever And everyone gets on Where peace and love are reigning And all violence is gone If you did, would you call it heaven? If you did, would you call it home? If you did, would you call it heaven? If you did, would you call it home? Earth, to be honest with you, and the more violence and terrorism and selfishness and, I don't know, the more I long for heaven, the more I long for that place where God reigns and all is well. So we're going to think about that wonderful subject together. And uh, again this evening, it's I'm not actually going to be leading worship this evening. Sorry about that, Andy. But um, what I'm going to be doing is singing a couple of songs, playing you a couple of slideshows of photographs that I've taken with music in the background, and then do the second half of the heaven thing, okay? So I'm going to read to you from 1 John, uh, John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 6. Very familiar words, words of Jesus in John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I completely forgot about that, didn't I? There you go. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Second brief reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through to 4. Words of Paul to the people there in Colossae. Since then you have been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Wow. You also will appear with him in glory. We're very shy nowadays of even mentioning heaven, said C.S. Lewis quite a long time ago in a book called The Problem of Pain. He said, we're afraid of the jeer about pie in the sky and of being told that we're trying to escape the duty of making a happy world here and now into dreams of a happy world elsewhere. But he went on to say, either there is pie in the sky or there is not. If there is not, then Christianity is false, for this doctrine is woven into its whole fabric. If there is, then this truth, like any other, must be faced. The great man was right, wasn't he? There is either a heaven and a hell, or else there isn't. And if there is, what could possibly be more important than to find out as much as we can about both, including how to be sure of going to the former, to heaven, and how to be certain of avoiding the latter, hell. 
that we were thinking about last week, really gave me an encouragement when Andy phoned me on Thursday and we talked about the services. And I said, I think I'm talking about heaven. And he said, well, that's great because we talked about hell last week. And God had been putting on my heart for weeks to talk about heaven today. So I'm sure that's where we should be. And what I'd like to do this evening under this overall title of our eternal home is to take a quick look at some of the things the world has to say about heaven, then to remind you of some of the fundamental things that the Bible has to say about heaven. Then we'll touch on the importance of setting our minds on heaven, indeed our whole being on heaven, before winding up quickly with some thoughts about this vital aspect of heaven and our faith. So we're going to start with what I'm calling heaven and the world. And this is where we take a very quick look at what the world at large has said about heaven. Every culture has wrestled with the question of an afterlife, said this lady, Barbara Walters, who was a great journalist and presenter on American television. And most of us have come to a similar conclusion, she says. The bad end up in hell and the good go to heaven. If you were a Viking, she said, who died in battle, fierce goddess warriors known as Valkyries would transport you to Viking heaven, Valhalla, where you would join an eternal feast. Whereas the Romans, she said, thought they became immortal and were spirited off to paradise on a fiery four-horse chariot. Now, those two things are interesting, aren't they? Particularly in the light of Psalm 23, 5 and 6 and Elijah's translation into heaven on the chariot. In Hinduism, with its emphasis on reincarnation, coming back as something else, the concept of heaven is not as prominent as in many religions. Whilst heaven in Hinduism is temporary until your next birth, the permanent state that Hindus are aiming for is called moksha, and moksha is seen as the soul's liberation from this cycle of life and death and a reestablishment of one's own fundamental divine nature. So Hinduism believes you eventually become a god through all these different manifestations. Buddhists, according to the Dalai Lama, believe that heaven is the best place to further develop the spiritual practice. And the final goal of Buddhism is actually to become Buddha. And for the Muslim, heaven is a place where every wish is immediately fulfilled. According to Islamic texts, those who dwell in heaven are said to wear costly apparel, partake in exquisite banquets, and recline on couches inlaid with gold or precious stones, with inhabitants rejoicing in the company of their parents and their wives and their children, and with so-called consorts called huris. Theophysists, I practice that word, Theophysists conveniently believe that each religion, including its own, has its own individual heron, heaven. And brethren used to think like that. I can say that because I come from brethren stock. They used to think there was a separate compartment for them all on their own. But theophysists believe this. You know, everyone has their own individual heaven in various regions of the upper astral plane that fits the description of the heaven that is given in that religion. Whereas the atheist view of heaven was very eloquently summed up by a person called John McCrerick. I don't know what I did there. I pressed the wrong button. John McCrerick said this. He was an atheist. He was a former racing pundit, horse racing pundit. He said, as far as I'm concerned, that's it. When you're dead, you're dead. It's all over. In my case, to the relief of many. All this going on about heaven, he said, is nonsense. Fairy stories all made up. Wow. Hopeless, absolutely hopeless. And that brings us on to what used to be one of our culture's idea of heaven. And I don't think it's as prominent now as it used to be when I was a bit younger, but actually it was a faintly ridiculous concept that, that can be summed up in two short words, cloud and harp. And for some reason, great many people, including a number of cartoonists, actually use this idea of eternity being spent serenely wafting around on your own personal cloud to the dulcet tones of your own miniature harp. Now such an activity might be fairly pleasant for an hour or two, or even a bit longer if your name was Harpo Marx, but for eternity? Is that what you want to be doing for eternity? Floating around in your own cloud just playing a little harp? Randy Olcorn, American preacher and pastor, has written a wonderful book called Heaven. And uh, it's a lengthy book, it's a deep book, but it's a wonderful book. And in that book he says this, he says, Eternity, because of per pervasive distortions of what heaven is like, it's common for Christians not to look forward to heaven. 
or even to dread it. I think that's really sad. That becomes because some believers have picked up false ideas about heaven and what it might be like. They're dreading it. They don't really want to go. Who do you think's behind that? Who do you think is behind that way of thinking? Who's ultimately responsible for such a warped view of our eternal home? Listen to what John says in Revelation 13, 6. The beast opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name. Here it is. And his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. The beast. Who or what is the beast? He's not that guy on... uh, you know, that quiz program on telly, by the way, the chasers. Um, the beast in the Bible is, is the Antichrist, specifically and more scarily, the, the last of the Antichrists, because there's going to be a little series of Antichrists. And Satan empowers these demonic beings to lead his last desperate onslaught against God and his people. And in Revelation, we find that the beast is a powerful pawn of Satan, the devil who described, who's described himself as the father of lies. Satan need not convince us, says Elkhorn, that heaven does not exist. He need only convince us that heaven is a place of boring, unearthly existence. If we believe that, we'll be robbed of all our joy and anticipation and we'll set our minds on this life and not the next, and therefore will not be motivated to share our faith. I think some Christians have got hold of the idea that eternity is one endless praise and worship party. Don't believe it. We're going to worship God in heaven like we've never worshipped him before, but he has other things for us to do. If I had longer, I'd talk a bit about that. Enough of this stuff about the world. Let's look at what the Bible has to say, what God himself has to say about heaven, because that's more important than what the world says, obviously, to people like you and me. The revealed word of God, breathed out by the Lord of heaven himself, and so utterly reliable. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. Now, that seems a very simple little sentence, doesn't it? In my Father's house are many rooms. But if that was all he said about heaven, we would know at least three things about heaven for certain. And the first has to do with heaven's form, because Jesus said, in my Father's house. That word house, and we all live in one, implies somewhere physical as opposed to merely spiritual. It implies a material location rather than a mystical, ethereal, astral kind of state. At least one scholar I read on this actually believes that heaven is more a state of mind than it is a place. Well, he hasn't listened to Jesus because that's the exact opposite of what Jesus explicitly said. I'm going there, he says, to prepare a place for you. Not a state of mind, a place. The Greek word that's used here is this little word topos. And you may recognize that because it comes from words like, or it's, it, it's where we get our word topography from. And if you've ever done ge- geography, you'll know the word topography because it has to do with the natural features of an area, of a location. It was used to describe in the Greek regions and localities and, and even a place where a person or thing lives. And Jesus was talking about a real and actual place when he was talking about heaven. Not this sort of idea of a nebulous sphere of disembodied consciousness. We know that for certain. And when we get to the end of the book, to Revelation chapter 21, and verse 21, uh, in fact, 12 through 21, we're told a bit about heaven's dimensions and some of its specific architectural features. Hence, my first line of my song. Don't know if you believe in a place where the gates are pearls and the streets are gold. Where do I get from? In my imagination? No, it comes from Scripture. It comes from Revelation. So that's one thing we can know about heaven. It's a place, a material place. Secondly, capacity. Heaven's capacity. In my Father's house are many rooms. Many rooms. Greek word here is the little word polis. And we get words like polygon and polycarbonate and other poly words because 
The meaning in the New Testament of the word polis is many or much or great or plentiful. And it suggests an ample quantity, a great number, an abundance, many rooms. That says something about its capacity, doesn't it? Its spaciousness, its expanse, its extent. Part of my family lives in Canada. Our youngest son emigrated 15, 16 years ago, and he's got his family there, his wife and his five children now. (laughs) Makes me tired thinking about it. But when we go over there, he lives in southwest Ontario, and it's just a little corner of the country. And it's as far from the other side of Canada as it is from us. It's a huge country. Didn't appreciate it, so I went there. It's absolutely enormous. And I've yet to visit any of its really wide open spaces. I've been to Toronto, I've been to London, Ontario, where he lives, and I've been to a little, you know, a few little out of the way places, but some of the wild places there I've never visited. But if you get out of any city or town in Canada, you'll find that very few of the homes have fences or walls around their garden. After all, a fence or a wall is your way of protecting your little bit of land, isn't it? It says, you know, this is mine, keep off. That's what your fence says. But who cares if a neighbor treads on the edge of your lawn if there's a couple of acres of it, as most of the houses seem to have out in the country in Canada, stretching back into the distance, perhaps with a bit of woodland at the back. When I was a boy, I used to wonder if there would be enough space in heaven for all the people who had trusted Christ, like me, to take, to take them. Enough room for everybody. I should have spared my nerves. Jesus said there are many rooms. And we're not talking box rooms. We're not talking little anterooms, like the room I just met with Andy in, outside there. Not little rooms like that, rooms that you'd have a job to swing a cat in, if indeed there are cats in heaven. You're probably hoping there are, some of you, some of you hoping they're not. But, you know, vast rooms, enormous rooms, spectacular rooms. Basing his calculation on the distances and dimensions set out in Revelation 21, one writer has worked out that even if the eventual population of heaven exceeded 290 trillion, unlikely, and even if half its space was given over to God's throne and court and another quarter was taken up with streets, there would still be enough space for everyone to have more than 100 rooms that are all 16 feet square. Now, don't ask me how he worked that out. But that just gives you a little idea. You know, the spaciousness of heaven, its form, its capacity, and thirdly, Jesus says something about its permanence. And I love this. He said there will be many rooms. And the word there isn't mansions, as the old version used to translate this. The Greek word is mone, which more literally means dwelling places. It's a word that's only used twice in the New Testament, but it's, it's more common in everyday Greek. And basically the root form of this verb means to stay. It means to remain. It means to persist and continue. My father's house, said Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Lotz, my father's house is a home that's built to last. Not just for a lifetime, but forever. That's a concept that's hard for us to grasp. When you're young, you think people are old when they're 18. I was kind of silently weeping, having just reached retirement. I still have a mum who's 90, so I can perhaps look forward to a few more years. But this is a concept that's hard to grasp, isn't it? Eternity, forever and ever. That phrase crops up 44 times in the Bible. The word everlasting crops up 62 times in the Bible. Here in the body, said an old bishop of yesteryear, we are in lodgings, tents, tabernacles. We must submit to many changes. But in heaven, he said, we shall be settled at last. Amen. So in that seven-word phrase, we've learned that heaven is a real place, not an abstract state of mind. It's a massive place. It's got plenty of room for everyone, all God's children, to have plenty of room. And it's an enduring place. It will never deteriorate, never be destroyed. All that's certain. But there are one or two things that are not so explicit. The Bible hints at things that we can't be sure of, at least not yet. John says, what we will be has not yet been made known. That's an interesting thing to think about. Paul said, now we see as a poor reflection, as in a mirror. 
Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully. So there's only a certain amount we can know for sure about heaven. Those three things and a few others. So it's not a subject to be dogmatic about. It's not a subject to get on our high horse about and think, well, I've worked out all the details. No. There are things you don't know. Things I don't know. Things that people I've read, even Randy Alcorn in his 400-page book, doesn't know. Hallelujah. We need to talk about it with grace and humility. That was our second point, just to had three sub-points. I'm good at doing that. It's a preacher's trick. Um, so we're going to go on to our third point, which is heaven and our minds. Heaven and our minds. Back to verse 1 of John 14. Jesus says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. I found that very interesting. As he introduces his words about heaven, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Then he talks to them about heaven. And he, he seems to be implying and thinking that thinking about his father's house is an antidote to worry. Thinking about heaven is an antidote to stress. He'd begun to prepare his disciples for what lay ahead of him. And they were clearly upset about it. He told them he was going to die. And he says, where I'm going, you can't follow. But you will follow later. And perhaps he saw some anxiety in their faces and could feel their fear as he said to them, I will be with you only a little while longer. And then he said, don't let this throw you. That's a Sprackland translation, but virtually that's what he said. Trust me, he says. There's plenty of room for you in my father's home. In other words, he says to them, don't worry. Don't get anxious about what's going to happen to me because it won't be the end. Think about heaven. Focus your minds on my father's house because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And it seems to me that one of the reasons that our hearts can become unsettled and anxious is that we don't have a firm enough grasp of the reality of heaven or perhaps that we don't even think about it, hardly ever at all. When was the last time you sat and thought about heaven? For me, it was when I prepared this talk. And I hadn't thought about it for ages. The accusation used to be leveled at Christians, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I think that's turned on its head with a lot of us. We're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. Set your minds on things above, says Paul to the Colossians. Set your minds on things above, and that could include heaven, because that's where Christ is seated, isn't it? In other words, make heaven the focus of your affections and your longings. Heaven where Jesus is. Set your hearts on it. Don't set it on worldly stuff, on more and more things that you can buy and places you can go. Set them on heavenly things, priceless things that will last forever. And then he says in verse 2, set your minds on things above. Not just your emotions, not just your heart, but your mind. Set your conscious thoughts on heaven, your intellect, your brain, your powers of understanding. Not just your feelings, but also your sense and your reason. And thirdly, he says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, fix your eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Our hearts, our minds, and our eyes. That's a trinity of sensory perception. Minds, hearts, eyes. If we can't envision it, says Randy Alcorn, we can't look forward to it. Which may not be entirely true, but there is truth in it. If we can't look forward to heaven, or worse, don't really look forward to it at all, then we will cling to this life for all it is worth, as if it was the only life there is. Which has huge implications for the way in which we view issues like poverty and persecution and pain and death. Discussions of heaven tend to be either hyper-imaginative or utterly unimaginative, he says. Bible believers have tended towards the latter, the unimaginative. And yet both approaches are inadequate. What we need is a biblically inspired imagination. An imagination that can soar and think about higher things, but is safely grounded on the rock that is the word of God. Heaven and the world, heaven and the Bible, heaven and our minds, lastly, heaven and our faith. I was watching Breakfast News quite some time ago now, and they ran an item 
about the fact that apparently only one in five of us, and that's everybody, not just believers, but only one in five of us talk seriously about death before it happens. Even then, apparently, most of the talk is about making wills or what kind of send-off we'd like, what kind of music we'd like played at our funeral service. One of the most popular, incidentally, is My Way by Frank Sinatra, which I find incredibly sad. I did it my way. Not surprising, in the whole of that sequence on the TV, not one word was said about the spiritual dimension of death, about preparation to meet our maker. And yet, if there is but the slightest chance that the Bible contains a true record of this unique person that we know as Jesus, and that he was speaking the truth when he said, I am the way and the truth and life, and no one can come to the Father but by me. If that is all true, then surely the Christian faith has to be worth checking out. Because what is a few hours, what is a few days, even a few weeks or months in the context of what might be an eternity in either heaven or hell? Apparently there was a sign hanging above a church door in Staffordshire somewhere and it said this, this is the gate of heaven. Enter ye all by this door. Sadly, there was a little note pinned underneath that one and it said the door is kept locked because of draft. Please use the back entrance. I want to make one thing very clear to you. There is no back entrance to heaven. The Bible makes it absolutely clear there's no back door. Its witness is clear and plain. There is only one way in and that's by way of true repentance and faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says man's destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Jesus himself said God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Sunday school teacher was taking her class talking about heaven. She said, if I sold my house and my car and had a big garage sale and gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? No, the children said. Well, if I kept the church clean every day and, and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven again? The children said, no. Well, then if I was kind to animals and I gave sweets to all the children and I loved my husband, would that get me into heaven? And again, there was this resounding no from the children who'd been very well taught. Well, she continued, then how can I get to in heaven? A little five-year-old boy put his hand up and said, please, miss, you've got to be dead. <laughs> well, that's clever, but it's not strictly true. It's not strictly true. Bible says we'll not all sleep and he wasn't talking about a church service he was talking about death we won't all die he says but we will all be changed he was talking to Christians of course to those who committed their lives to Christ their destinies into his hands but he says very definitely not, not every human being is going to experience death because at the end of this present age as we know it the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout and after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Wow, I'm hoping I'm, that, I'm, I'm still alive then. What an incredible experience to be lifted up and meet the Lord in the air. So you haven't actually necessarily got to be dead to get into heaven, but the one thing you have got to be is born again. You've got to be born again. Jesus said, I tell the truth, no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. In other words, by the grace of God being made fully spiritually alive through faith in Jesus Christ. Does the Bible say we'll all be there? Everyone who lives in Black Dog, everyone who lives in the next village, Paddington and all the other places all over the world, is everybody going to be there? No. No. There is that other place you were thinking about last week. John says in Revelation 21, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those who have trusted Jesus and have their name recorded in the register will be there. I need to stop. First time I went to this place, Tintersville, this magnificent 
property up near Bristol, belonging to the National Trust. I went with a real sense of anticipation because I'd seen pictures of this Gothic mansion in its heyday, gleaming in the sunlight. Well, it was quite a long walk from the car park to the reception and then into the house. But my sense of expectation was building with every step as we walked towards the house. And my shutter finger, because I am a photographer, was feeling increasingly itchy the closer we got to the house. So imagine my intense disappointment when the house finally came into view and it was covered. I mean, literally covered from top to toe in scaffolding and plastic sheeting. This was taken on my second visit. I could hardly believe it. It was like a death shroud. I thought, what have I come to? And inside the house was more like a mausoleum than a mansion because the sheeting kept out nearly all of the light. Every room was dark. Every room was dingy. I thought about that as I sat at my desk and wrote this talk because if there's one thing I'm not going to be when heaven finally comes into view, it's disappointed. The Queen of Sheba thought she knew all about Solomon's splendor until she paid a visit and saw it for herself. And then she said, I didn't believe these things until I came and saw them with my own eyes and the half had not been told me, for in wisdom and wealth you have far exceeded the report that I heard. Friends, heaven's going to far exceed anything I've said this morning. You're not going to be disappointed. And it's going to be a million fold what the Queen of Sheba felt when we first set our eyes on our eternal home. And I can't wait. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. That's all I want to say really this morning, except say if, if you're not really sure that heaven is where you're bound right now, if you don't really know Jesus personally, then please talk to me at the end or a friend who brought you or someone you know here in leadership at the church. We'd love to help you further on that. And to everyone else, if you'd like to hear a little bit more about heaven, love to see you tonight. What time is that? 6.30. Yeah. Maybe see you later. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Um, we're going to close by uh, singing a song about that only route into heaven. Uh, there is a redeemer. <laughs> pray is uh, as we leave this place um, through the coming days the weeks the months lord that we as chris's challenges continue to have that heavenly mindset and focused on where those of us who have a relationship with you know we're going to go lord but also conscious that those who don't are going somewhere terrible and that 
that should motivate us and challenge us to tell others around us to help us all get as many people into heaven as we can. Pray that in your name. Amen.